When we gathered for the first time to discuss what would eventually become this presentation, whether whiteness work, it all came pouring out. Weeks, months, years of stories about what it is to be a person of the global majority in the academy. We laughed at the time, but the sheer volume of it was overwhelming. X person said X thing, and then can you believe she did that horrible thing like, well, I'm sorry if you're offended by it. I know, right? Same thing at X institution. And then the very next day, I get dumped with all these white students and colleagues who suddenly think I'm the racism whisperer. It's awful. How do we productively understand such experiences beyond simply listing them? Like the wall of collective experiences in the open letter, white colleagues listen by the Revolution or Nothing Network. How do you theorize a microaggression? How do you theorize the constant background noise of racial slights, insults, and minimizations that is just there, like weather? And like weather is sometimes worse than you. In that opening conversation, we talked about how racism at work was something we just felt in a deeply embodied way, even as we talked about institutional racism, systemic racism. Were these words just to spare the feelings of white colleagues? There are no racists, it seems, in systemic racism, just bad systems. But who made the bad system? There are no bad people in our liberal institutions, it seems, just whiteness. This disconnect between the deeply embodied way racism is experienced, the affective dimension of racism, and the disembodied way we speak of institutional racism is the heart of our three contributions in this collective presentation. In her famous essay, Theory as Liberatory Practice, Bell Hooks starts by saying, I came to theory because I was hurting. The pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around and within me. It is an embodied experience that motivates Hooks's scholarship and research, a way of surviving racism, misogyny, oppression. In a similar way, cultural worker and PhD student Gemma Desai's widely circulated open access report on diversity in British arts organizations, This Work Isn't For Us, uses auto theory and memoir as a springboard to theorization. This research came from an embodied place as a feeling, something I held in my body that it was hard to articulate. Unlike white colleagues listen, this presentation is not an open letter. There is little here for white people to learn from. It is instead intended as a collective reparative act to adopt a phrase from Hooks in writing, we may see a location for healing. In both Hooks and Desai's cases, like so many marginalized scholars and people, one's scholarly orientation is prompted not merely by one's positionality, but by the embodied experiences that positionality affords. Our presentation follows in this tradition. Bad day, Atlanta, March, 2021. I have a lot to say that cannot be said because I have accepted apologies because it wasn't intentional. My dad used to talk about swallowing bitterness, which apparently is a common phrase in East Asian cultures. It means to keep the bad feelings down, to endure. It is a virtue. The day after six Asian women were murdered by a white man in Atlanta, Georgia, I was told by a colleague we should focus on the murder of the white woman in Clapham Common in the first instance. I was told that FYI, the police have said the motivation of the crime was still not known. I was told the murderer had a bad day. I was told that my colleague nonetheless recognized intersectionality. It's now become somewhat commonplace to recognize that anti-racist and diversity work in institutions places an oversized burden of emotional labor on people of color. As a reader of Marx, I always find this annoying. You're using the word wrong, I want to say. Feeling difficult feelings is not emotional labor unless you're being paid for it. 
In her groundbreaking 1983 book, The Managed Heart, Sociologist Arlie Russell Hochschild studied flight attendants and tax collectors to show how these groups of workers manage their emotions as a necessary part of the wage relation. She found in her interviews, their techniques of emotional management were very similar to the acting exercises of Konstantin Stanislavski. This self-management of feeling, she said, is emotional labor. The emotional labor of working in institutions of higher education that which we are remunerated for is not to show feeling or to show only positive feelings, to swallow bitterness, to smile through it, to accept that white allies are doing their best even though there is so much more to be done. It is to manage feelings so well you might as well not be feeling. In the face of a fog, hailstorm, rainstorm, cloud of racial microaggressions, emotional labor is to be generous, to say nothing, to have a conversation later that never transpires because having that conversation, that actual between colleagues conversation can only happen after 5 p.m. and then why even bother? Am I right? It's striking how, as an East and Southeast Asian person, I'm supposed to be built for this kind of emotional la labor, or <laughs> so the stereotype goes. Swallowing bitterness was indeed something my late father talked about. But, as Keila Schuler points out, the perception of East Asian people as overly mechanical and lacking in emotional development served Western imperialist interests since these qualities marked us as easily moved by others, particularly employers. The stereotype of robotic, unfeeling, servile masses of Asians motivated great acts of violence from white workers, such as the Chinese massacre of 1871, to the shootings of six Chinese and Korean women in Atlanta less than six months ago to the almost daily acts of violence against ESEA people during COVID. It also manifests in other ways, those slights and offhand comments that force us to remember that the imperial world still does not see us as fully human. The day before six Asian women were murdered by a white man in Atlanta, Georgia, Korean American actor Steven Yeun becomes the first Asian American to be nominated for best actor at the Academy Awards. The day before, six women who could have been my cousins, my aunts, my mother or grandmothers were murdered by a white man. A colleague tells me that Steven Yun's face always seems so expressionless to him. Steven Yun's face, his face, my face. In April, the Irish photographer Matt Lawfrey was featured in Vice magazine for his project, My Colorful Past in which he colorizes and edits historical black and white photographs. The newest incarnation of this project represented photographs of prisoners from Tuol Slang prison in Cambodia, where it is estimated 18,000 prisoners were tortured and killed by the Khmer Rouge. Without the consent of family members or other Cambodian community organizations, Lawfrey photoshopped smiles onto their faces. With his Wacom tablet and software package, he pulled up the corners of the eyes and lips of 00721, an unnamed and unknown boy who was never identified and whose body was never found. He made the skin golden brown. He guessed at the color of the t-shirt. He did it, he says, to humanize the tragedy. The original black and white photo swiftly discarded the new images belonged to Lawfrey, his colorful past. The outcry was swift and immediate and included criticism from the Cambodian Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts and the National Cambodian Heritage and Killing Fields Museum. But the damage of the revelation was already done. He wanted to humanize the tragedy because the expressionless Asian face could not be seen as human. The only way to humanize the tragedy is to show a little feeling as long as it's a positive one. It would be easy to talk about this enforced emotional labor as gaslighting. But for the East and Southeast Asian experience, I prefer the Asian American writer, Kathy Park Hong's conceptualization of minor feelings. Minor feelings, she writes, occur when American optimism is enforced upon you, which contradicts your own racialized reality, thereby creating a static of cognitive dissonance. Hong is talking about the United States, but 
the model minority stereotype, as I have found as an Asian Canadian who now lives in the UK, is everywhere. Minor feelings are the friction of the gears grinding, of feelings kept in place. They are the static of trying to express and being called expressionless. She goes on, quote, Minor feelings are also the emotions we are accused of saving when we decide to be difficult. In other words, when we decide to be honest. When minor feelings are finally externalized, they are interpreted as hostile, ungrateful, jealous, depressing, and belligerent, affects ascribed to racialized behavior that whites consider out of line, end quote. Because under late capitalism, it's easier to put a smile on one's face than to give voice to one's minor feelings, we become strangers to ourselves, alienated not only from our labor, but from our bodies. She writes, for as long as I could remember, I've struggled to prove myself into existence. I, the modern day Scrivener, working five times as hard as others, and still I saw my hand dissolve, then my arm, end quote. Hong's subtle reference to Herman Melville's Bartleby, the worker who famously said, I would prefer not to, is both apt and inadequate. The inscrutable Bartleby gets to be a martyr, a wrench in the cogs of capitalism. Inscrutable Asians, less so. Because our parents were immigrants, because they sacrificed, because they starved back home and they work so hard in you, what do you have to complain about? East and Southeast Asians in the global North become indebted. All the while, as Hong says, feeling like a dog cone of shame, a urinal cake of shame. The writer Gia, Gia Tolentino commented, reviewing this book, quote, to be Asian in the global north, Hong suggests, is to be tasked with making an injury inaccessible to a body that has been injured, it is to be pissed on at regular intervals while dutifully minimizing the odor of piss. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. I felt outraged when I first read Hong's metaphor of a urinal cake of shame. It's never been in my nature to minimize anything. My late father was terrible at swallowing bitterness, and honestly, so am I. But only after reflecting on the Atlanta murders in March did I realize that perhaps my own acts of minimization are unconscious and driven by structures and systemic forces far beyond my control. They're driven by what Sar Ahmed calls the institutionalization of whiteness, how institutional spaces are shaped by the proximity of some bodies and not others, or by what Deborah Brewis calls the embodiment of whitely vocalities. Her research was formed by listening into spaces where equality, diversity, and inclusion was discussed and painstakingly outlining the speech acts through which whiteness or whiteliness kept power in place in higher education institutions, ventriloquizing, megaphoning, whispering, holding of tongues, cannibalizing, and disclaiming. Disclaiming. I think of how this final one keeps Black people and people of the global majority, and not only East and Southeast Asians, from giving voice to those minor feelings. In disclaiming your whiteness, your allyship, telling me that you know there is more to be done, I lose the opportunity to give voice to small affects of loss or grief or rage. I can't get at the wound because there is a dog cone of allyship in the way. The microaggressions of my colleague in the wake of a white man's bad day are eventually bandaged in a meeting where I... <laughs> I earned my salary through an honest day's emotional labor. But the wound remains an opening where institutional whiteness denied me the opportunity to grieve. Rage and grief intertwine the color gray, the sky heavy and full like a prairie storm the moment before. Every Asian person has some story like this at work, at school, you know, being told your lunch is disgusting, being mistaken for another Asian. <sighs> Listen, the last thing I want to do is amplify narratives that focus on the hyper individuality of racism, you know, not belonging, being caught between two worlds, as important as these narratives are, but... <sighs> 
I don't know. Instead, I think looking at the affect of racism, like the weather, can draw our attention to the way imperialist violence blows through our houses today. Wind blows, the door opens. There's no afterlife to imperial violence in Asia because it is happening now. We grieve a tragedy in the present, photographs that for us are already in full color. When I saw Matt Lawfrey's colorized photographs of the unnamed victims of Tulo slang, I thought of the sepia-toned images in my family's archive, pasted in albums that my mother and I leafed through in the wake of my father's death. In one, we came across a photo of my grandmothers, my mother's mother and my father's mother as girls who'd been friends as children long before my mother and father met or were even born. The picture is here. On the left, uh, you see the woman whose name would become Maximina Veloso Yap, a Filipina Chinese girl sent away to boarding school in Xiamen, China. On the right, Cho Jim Chu, a young Chinese woman who gave my father his large eyes and strong nose. I never knew either of them. Both women simply became ama in my imagination. How different their lives would be only a few years after this photo was taken. How violent the winds of coloniality would be, shattering windows, blowing doors closed for both. Cho Jim Chu, her husband imprisoned, raising seven children, including my father, in an occupied city as bombs dropped upon the beaches of Gulangyu Island. A bold and defiant woman, she never got along with the family into which she married. Because my father was a middle child, a problem child, gifted and clever, but possessed of a stubbornness and devilish mischief that made him her singular vexation, she gave him her last name. She became a staunch Maoist, and when land reform was announced, she stood at the top of the steps and declared to her in-laws, you told me I cursed this family and now I finally have. She laughed like a witch. They fled as refugees to Hong Kong. They often went hungry and the children worked. I wonder if Maximina Veloso Yap would think of her childhood friend while she was married to Vicente Veloso Yap and raising her seven children in a large, beautiful compound in Makati, Manila. Children so spoiled the yayas would make them all separate meals for dinner. Perhaps not until in the early 1970s, they reconnected, just as the Veloso Yap family was preparing to leave Manila for Canada during the imposition of martial law by the authoritarian Marcos regime. She was over 60 by this time, suddenly faced with living in a new country whose language she spoke due to American colonialism, but whose culture she knew little about. What would it be like in Vancouver? They knew no one there other than, by chance, the wandering, wayward son of her childhood school friend, who then met and fell in love with her youngest daughter. I wonder if a photographer would glance upon this picture of two East and Southeast Asian women, unsmiling, dressed in chong sam, and think they were too expressionless. Would he want to put a smile on their faces to humanize them? Would he recognize the story behind their inscrutable eyes? After all, it isn't that exceptional a story. All of us whose lives are touched by the violence of coloniality might tell a story like this, including those whose lives were ended when a white man had a bad day. Say their names and try to say them correctly. Just try. Xiao Jie Tan, Dao Yu Feng, Delena Ashley Gonzalez, Paul Andre Michaels, Su Chung Park, Hyun Grant, Sun Cha Kim, Yong A Yu. Minor feelings are produced by the structures that entrap East and Southeast Asians in the global North, but they're lived and felt in the body. It is this fact that gives me hope that we might find others who share such embodied experience and by sharing come to a better understanding of them and the subtle ways white supremacy enacts its power. 
As Stephen Yun says, we profess that we're caught in the white gaze, and that's true. But we forget that we are also that gaze. The gaze is encoded into us, and that last boss is yourself. Weather, whiteness, work. The weather. The UK is obsessed with the weather. As an Indian immigrant on this island, this British obsession has always struck me as both pervasive and deeply disingenuous. When people talk about the weather, in my experience, they are really talking about nothing. Over the years, I have come to conclude that this obsession is really an avoidance tactic of sorts. That by talking about the wet weather, what we are really doing is not talking about that very thing that we all know we urgently need to talk about. Over time, I have come to acquire raincoats, wind cheaters, snow boots, wellies, hats, gloves, earmuffs, shorts, sandals, sunglasses, sunscreen, etc., etc., to brace myself against whatever weather comes at me. I have learned the skill of wearing layers. In our initial exchanges, inspired by and following on from Christina Sharp's foundational formulations on the weather as, I quote, the totality of our environments, the weather is the total climate, and the, and the climate is anti-Black, end quote, Mojisola, Broderick and I discussed that racism in our academy operates very much like a weather system. Its currents of circulation invisible, its material impact all pervasive, and its scale exponential on the lives of Black and global majority people. Some days we experience it like an annoying and ever-present drizzle that, over time, seeps through to our skin and leaves us feeling damp and cold. Some days, using Broderick's words from past exchanges, it is an all-encompassing heavy fog that refuses to lift, making it difficult to see and think effectively. Some days, it drenches us to the core and leaves us feeling shriveled from within. Some days, it freezes our souls with its bitter iciness. And some days, its searing heat scorches us, leaving us with blisters and open wounds all over. And then, there are days when we experience all of this at once. And no layers, no boots, no coats, no gloves, no waterproofing can protect us from our daily weathering of this system. We do not wish to dilute the focus of Sharp's conceptualization of the climate as anti-Black. If anything, we wish to extend her powerful observation to wider discourses of race and racism as experienced by us in the Academy, a climate that is shaped by and designed for all those who benefit from the supremacist system of whiteness. Whiteness a climate of whiteness. When I was writing the first rendition of this paper for our joint keynote at ISTR, the world was witnessing a humanitarian disaster unfolding in South Asia due to a devastating second wave of the pandemic. Through that time, us South Asian and South Asian heritage people across the diaspora were gripped with guilt, fear, helplessness, anger, and devastation in dealing with the loss of loved ones and in anticipation of the loss of loved ones. We mobilized from thousands of miles away to get our families and friends the urgent medical treatment they needed. Through all this time, British higher education institutions who rely so heavily on international students from South Asia and employ so many South Asian heritage staff remained silent. Through this time, the overwhelming whiteness of our system expected us to work as relentlessly as at any other time, 
without compromising the institution's productivity and the student experience. Through this time, not a single meeting acknowledged those of us who were experiencing unimaginable uncertainties and trauma. And this was while simultaneously advertising staff well-being vouchers via weekly newsletters. Through this time, the fog at its heaviest and densest stayed close to the ground, lying low, weighing us down while we sat at our desks on our Zoom calls while simultaneously navigating WhatsApp messages of crisis back home. We also witnessed through May our institutional anti-racism and decolonization working groups stay silent as the world looked on in horror at the atrocities carried out on Palestinian lives. If challenged, we were reminded that it is important to look at, and I quote, both sides of a complex conflict, end quote. And now, I can only imagine the sheer heartbreak that our Afghan and Afghan heritage colleagues and students are feeling, fearing for the lives and human rights of their loved ones as the UK commits to, uh, to resettling a staggeringly cruel and embarrassing 5,000 Afghani citizens over the next year. What is whiteness if not the ability to decolonize one's curriculum and write monographs and grant applications on race, race justice and colonialism while simultaneously refusing to acknowledge 21st century settler colonial state violence unfolding before our eyes? What is whiteness if not the racist capitalist drive and savior complex with which the women of Afghanistan were used as the valid grounds on which to reap war and devastation on a nation for two decades, only to turn their backs on the same women and citizens of a nation in their hour of greatest need. Whiteness is a state of incompassion. Whiteness is a state that centers nothing beyond its own interests. Whiteness in academia is excuse after excuse for grant applications, exploiting lives and perpetuating harm in the name of research. And then remaining silent when the human rights of their very same subjects of inquiries are violated and abused. Whiteness is a state of complicity and complacency. Whiteness shapes daily actions and inactions. Yes, your silences are harmful. Yes, your convivialities that try to smoothen out tensions hurt. Yes, no matter how many times we speak our truths, you somehow still manage not to listen. Ghislaine Kinwani, a radical psychologist and author of the book Living While Black, The Essential Guide to Overcoming Racial Trauma, writes in a recent Twitter thread that comes from her conversations with white people. She says that she has come to realize that the biggest fear of these white people is the fear of being called racist. Kinwani continues that deep down, this points to their fear of being racist. She says, and I quote, they simply fear part of themselves and that this part will be exposed. You might say the fear of being seen, end quote. She then goes on to ask white people how such fears might play out relationally on the black and brown people that they interact with. Quote, Imagine being in a team as the only person of color and being surrounded by people who fear being seen, fear being exposed, by extension, fear closeness to you, end quote. Kinwani dwells on the tactic of avoidance often deployed by well-intentioned white liberals who, while consciously condemning overt forms of racism, will not, however, publicly speak up against race injustices. Following Joel Koval's coining of the term in 1970, 
she speaks of such reticence to speak up, such reluctance to not unsettle whiteness as aversive racism. She concludes, quote, and as long as you refuse to reclaim your racism, you will most likely enact racism aversely. As per our framing comments, one of the most important interventions made by the open letter White Colleagues Listen by the Revolution or Nothing Network was the first of its kind public sharing of the wall of collective trauma from black and global majority colleagues in our departments. My overwhelming experience since the publication of this open letter has been one example after another of such aversive racism. Faced with such avoidance tactics from the field, I have found myself reevaluating my own strategies of where we go from here. I have come to realize that the future of this work, my work, cannot exist permanently in resistive relationality to whiteness. Instead, this work has to be about creating spaces for and uplifting each other as black and global majority people in the academy. It has to be about finding joy and healing in our own spaces and on our own terms. Conceptualized in this way, the work then becomes about not just seeking ways to survive our white disciplines, but about enabling and nourishing each other to thrive despite it. It becomes about seeking spaces and people with whom we can bask in the warmth and glow of sunshine. This is the only work I'm interested in going forward. Work. In their article, Joy is Resistance, race and digital humanities scholars Jessica H. Liu and Catherine Knight Steele remind us of the resistive power of black joy. They write, and I quote, the expression of joy is a subversive intervention in so far as it asserts black people as possessing a full range of emotions, end quote. Liu and Steele trace the foundational prevalence of black joy as resistance through histories of African-American cultural discourses. Their particular analyses of Twitter and Vine as digital spaces, which afford platforms to generate black joy as resistance, really speaks to me. It aligns with the impetus that led to the emergence of the Revolution or Nothing Network. The network currently exists as a digital space where we can convene via a mailing list that we have subscribed to. Such a space for black and global majority only colleagues is necessary in our academy. As Kelsey Blackwell reminds us, such spaces allow us to come together by listening to and empowering one another and enabling ourselves to embrace who we are, away from the dominant gaze of whiteness, to allow us to breathe and heal. Now, what is a year ago, the coming together of the Revolution or Nothing Network as a coalition and the co-authoring of the open letter allowed us precisely such opportunities to breathe collectively and to dream together towards possibilities of healing. The fast and furious responses to our open call to join the network signal the urgency for such a coalition. The generosity and collaboration in the co-authoring of the letter was in itself a transformative moment. The vast array of lived experiences, knowledge systems and voices that wrote the letter through every edit and contribution signaled an energizing presence amongst us, willing for alternative ways of knowing and being to come into existence. There was joy in writing on our own terms and the work was to make space for this joy. Even as we often wrote from places of deep pain and anger. But more long term, the work also requires crucially to organize ourselves as a network in non hierarchical ways that undo our own internalized colonial understandings of and reliance on notions of leadership and its investments in power. 
I regularly learn and unlearn from and with my colleague Sharanya Murali on this. Together, we reflect on how deep these internalized logics of seniority, ranks, and titles are amongst us Black and global majority people, and how much work we ourselves have to undertake to think beyond these systems in order to truly conjure anti-oppressive worlds. Our conversations have got me to really focus on the need to recognize and undo the systems of oppression that each of us uphold through our own actions and allegiances in the academy. It is deep and uncomfortable work to own our own privileges when surviving in a climate designed to oppress us. But that is the work that can make a meaningful difference. As Swati Arora in her brilliant essay, A Manifesto to Decenter Theatre and Performance Studies reminds us, and I quote, the critique of systemic injustice needs to go beyond the white colonial oppression as the central force and take into consideration the multiple forms of racializations and social oppressions beyond the global north, end quote. I take Aurora's cue here and advocate for our own network's organization to seek and build intergenerational, transpositional and transnational solidarity with global anti-oppression movements. To this end, in my concluding comments, I wish to evoke the early 20th century Indian lawyer, activist and social reformer, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar's anti-casteist activism through his slogan, educate, agitate, organize. Through an interdependency between three, these three concepts and actions, Ambedkar advocated for the power of change and uprisings against caste injustices. He famously shared his slogan in 1924 as the motto of an enterprise that opened hostels, schools, libraries, and social centers where Dalit youths could meet, study, and learn. The slogan proposed the vital need to educate oneself, to read and learn about the modus operandi of the caste system and other oppressive world systems. It then guided individuals to move on to agitating each other's learning through coalitional thinking and questioning of hierarchies and systems, awakening themselves out of states of denial and or apathy before organizing themselves into a systematic movement against caste tyranny, against the status quo. Human rights activist Mangesh Dahewale notes the recent resurgence of such Ambedkarite philosophy that is being mobilized by Dalits and other minoritized groups in India now, as they organize themselves into intersectional coalitions, fighting against the current Indian government's majoritarianism and Brahminical supremacy. There is much in common between the workings of white supremacy in the Western Academy and Hindu upper caste supremacy in India and the Indian diaspora. And as an upper caste Indian scholar carrying out anti-racist work in the UK, I have much to learn from my Indian peers who are putting their bodies on the line in their uprisings against the tyranny of upper caste Hindu supremacy. I will I want to bring to the Revolution or Nothing Network this crucial understanding of the importance of working non-hierarchically, intergenerationally, and across positionalities between ourselves. This, to me, is the work. And this work might require uncomfortable conversations amongst ourselves as we grapple with our own complicity in upholding hierarchies, oppressive structures, and investments in systems of power. This is the only way we can conjure justice and equity for our future generations of black and global majority scholars. To this end, I evoke the final words of Sadia Hartman in Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, as a dream I dream for them. Quote, guessing at the world and seizing a chance, she eludes the law and transforms the terms of the possible. The bodies are in motion. The gestures disclose what is at stake. The matter of life returns as an open question. 
the collective movement points towards what awaits us, what has yet to come into view, what they anticipate, the time and place better than here, a glimpse of the earth not owned by anyone. So everything depends on them and not the hero occupying center stage, preening and sovereign. Inside the circle, it is clear that every song is really the same song, but crooned in infinite variety, every story altered and unchanging. How can I live? I want to be free. Hold on. Weathering whiteness, island to island, questioning whether whiteness works. The door opens. I step in partially until the old man blocks my way. Ah, now, I only let this flat to Irish people. A gust of cold air. How do you know I'm not Irish, sir? You see, I went away and when I came back, there were these great big Chinese men here. So since then, I only let this flat to Irish people. Phil Lynott was, I only let this flat to Irish people. A cold fog of sadness descends. How do you know I'm not Irish, sir? He studies my dreadlocks through the sides of his eyes. Now you're splitting hairs. I turn around and go back out. It feels warmer outside than in the hallway of that house. I don't look back as the door closes behind me. That was the last time I tried to view a flat in Dublin. Having been turned down several times, my white partner and I decided that we would pretend I was a visiting friend. And the first time we did that, we were immediately offered a flat. And so we moved to Ireland, where my partner started her PhD at Trinity College Dublin, and I began looking for work. My first job was teaching Theatre of the Oppressed at Trinity, where I'd been an Erasmus student some years before. On the first day, I walked down the narrow corridor of the drama department, and the, the imposing figure of a very tall, middle-aged, grey-haired, bearded, softly smiling white man, the head of department, breezed towards me. Reaching out his huge hand, he stroked my hair and said, Oh, how lovely, and continued breezing past. No good morning, no welcome to the department, no who are you, simply oh how lovely, with a soft unwanted stroke as if I was a small animal who'd wandered into his garden. I froze, my breath got caught in my throat the way it could when the wind caught you on the cliff tops of Hoth on an October day off, blowing through your dreadlocks. The same dreadlocks that were groped by a woman standing too close behind me in the post office on Parnell Street as I queued for the dole money on those days between precarious teaching jobs and acting gigs. I swiftly turned around. What are you doing? I just want to touch it, she said, like my hair was a bunch of bananas on a market stall and she was pressing, pressing too hard to see if I was ripe. I learnt what dreadlocks can mean when I was waiting for a cheap dinner in a chip shop on that same street and a bunch of children of maybe eight or nine years old came in and started yanking at my hair like they were pulling ropes on a ship in a storm, jumping up and down laughing. What do you do when you're an adult being physically and racially abused by children and it's been going on since you were a child in 1971? I shaved my head in Dublin. I felt the cold more but I felt stronger and taller and safer for a while. My partner cried in the hairdresser. The barber, a brother, shook his head at my request. I grabbed the scissors myself and laughed. That bald head might have been what got me cast as the Buddhist girlfriend of a newly converted young Irish man in The Buddhist of Castle Knot by Jim O'Hanlon. It was an unlikely Christmas comedy addressing racism that the theatre critic Karen Fricker dismissed as another black girlfriend, black boyfriend play on a par with Roddy Doyle's Guess Who's Coming for the Dinner. Fricker was right, the play was thin, but it was trying to address the tide of racism sweeping the island. One of the most painful things was that the audiences sometimes roared with laughter when my character reappears towards the end of the play on crutches, covered in bruises, returning after mysteriously disappearing on Christmas Day. It was not laughter O'Hanlon had intended. My character had been beaten up by a group of racists, in inverted commas. 
I was off stage for about half an hour of the show. I learnt how to do my own bruise makeup in the dressing rooms of Dublin. I told you that the audience's laughter was one of the most painful things that happened in those performances, but the most painful was when I was in the wings with another actor who played my white boyfriend's mother. We were about to come on and serve a traditional Christmas dinner, holding hot plates, and I held mine with a tea towel. Except the plates weren't really hot. We were acting, right? It's just a job. But just before our cue to enter with the dinner plates, the actor, who always loved to have a little out-of-character chat in the wings just before we went on, turns to me and says, I could never hold a hot plate like this, but you probably wouldn't feel it, would you? And pulls my skin. Cue. And we're on. Yes, Rona, you're right. Sometimes whiteness scorches like the sun. It stings and you feel yourself peeling for days and in extremes you're left with scars, aren't you? But most of the time the racism was like the slow, soft rain, that persistent drizzle. You weather it twice as a black actor, in real life and then in fiction, like W.E. Du Bois' description of the double consciousness of blackness. I was murdered, beaten up, raped, drowned in the bath and abused so many times on stage and screen in Ireland. And then you take off your makeup, walk out and have something thrown at you in the street. One day pennies, the next day the n-word, my screen husband and extraordinary playwright George Wanaka Saremba had a glass of beer thrown at his head in a pub. So many stories he could tell. George and I were husband and wife in the first black family to regularly appear on RTE, Irish television, on the dirty soap, fair city, or fairly shitty, as Dubliners love to call it. My character, Nina Udense, ran a shop selling odd bits of plastic crap and t-shirts. The big Christmas story one year was racism. I accepted that the subject would probably be handled a little crassly, but hopefully in a well-meaning way. The storylines were as dreadful as my acting. Our screen son, Joshua, was dating a white girl and the racists, there they are again, never just white people doing shit things, were out to get him and us culminating in our house being daubed with the n-word and eventually burnt down, leading to the death of my husband, exit George. A lot of our storyline involved scenes just between white characters that I wasn't part of, but I remember overhearing another scene being shot at the same time where one of the racists calls my son's girlfriend an n-word loving bitch. He did say the n-word. I couldn't believe it. This was a family show screened at 7.30pm three times a week with an omnibus on Sunday afternoons, watched by a third of the Irish population. I sat there listening to a thunderstorm. Take two, take three, take four, like lightning flashes in front of your window pane. Back away, sit in the dark, be afraid. Cut! During lunch breaks in the RTE canteen, I would sometimes raise the subject of racism happening on the real streets. I was told by another cast member that the pregnant African woman who had been kicked to death on the Haypenny Bridge on Saturday night was probably a prostitute. She wasn't a prostitute, I said. She was a pregnant woman, and anyway, what difference would it make if she was a prostitute? She was beaten to death because she was black. Yeah, but what was she doing there? My colleague retorted and walked away. In that same canteen, a South Asian man walked in one day and scanning the room, as you do, he spots the only other brown faces and comes over to sit with George and I. We warmly welcome the brother, as you do, and it was his first day and so he was very excited. We asked him what his storyline was. He was surprised we didn't know. His character becomes friends with our son Joshua and they are going to stash Semtex in the store cupboard of our shop in a plan to blow up Limerick Airport as an act of revenge against the Irish government for allowing US planes to refuel in Ireland on their way to bomb Iraq, where his character comes from. What? But the actor was chuffed. It was his biggest job yet. A big story. I scanned the upcoming scenes and saw that we were due to become friends with this character when he comes into our shop to trade spices. But our shop sells football t-shirts and kids toys, I say to George. I know, Marge. We reluctantly shot the ridiculous spices scene and I felt like a total sellout. I marched up and walked straight into the office of the series editor. Unannounced, no appointment. Would you allow the use of the word cunt on this soap? What? Cunt or fuck before the watershed. Would you allow it? 
No, no, why are you? You weren't even allowed to say the word Jesus on Irish television at the time. So why do you constantly use the word, the N word, I said the word, before the watershed? The editor faff with the scripts, blowing a mini gale of paper all over his desk. He asks, is it in this week? Yes, it's in this week. You're the editor. I'll take it out. I'll take it out. Good. And another thing, why are you planning to explode bombs in the public imagination? Semtex, a Muslim man blowing up Limerick Airport. Don't you know that everything you do in this soap has consequences for us, black and Asian people out there on the street? Last week, George had a beer glass thrown at his head. There's never been an act of terrorism by a Muslim on this island. Why is this programme representing us like this? Representation produces meaning, throwing in a bit of Stuart Hall. The editor bumbled something about the plot still being in discussion. The Semtex scenes never aired, to my knowledge, and the reason I don't know is because I was swiftly written out of the show. I'm apparently still in London looking after my daughter. I'd be curious to know what happened to our shop. Leaving aside the soap, I did do some work I was proud of. I was part of the chorus in the back eye, which saw five black women on stage for the first time at the Abbey Theatre. I was the first black female artistic director of a theatre company in Ireland, Dublin Youth Theatre. I loved working with the young people there. It felt like shelter from the weather. One of the most joyous moments was directing the biggest ever pageant for the St Patrick's Day Festival. 717 year olds jumping to hip hop down O'Connell Street. Yeah, there were good times for me as a worker in Ireland. Sure, the sun shines sometimes on these islands, even in March. But just when you're feeling safe, it's hailstones. I'd always wanted to perform Beckett's brilliant Not I, where only a mouth speaks on stage. It seemed to be the greatest acting challenge. And so when I was invited by a leading Irish theatre director, whose name I've erased from my mind, to have a discussion about me playing the role, I was so excited. We sat and talked in the famous Bewley's Cafe for about two hours, energetically discussing how we would approach the play. Then finally, he looked at me, laughed and said, sure, we wouldn't even have to black you up. It was like the windows of the cafe had suddenly blown in. A hurricane, glass shattered everywhere and I was the only one trembling. Not I. I left my tea and decided to go home. Home to work on the other island that you've heard described by Broderick and Rayona, where the weather is pretty much the same and where I wear even more layers of protection. Back in Britain, I eventually became a playwright, alongside lecturing at Queen Mary, University of London. I recently wrote a youth theatre play for the National Theatre Connections programme called Wind Rush Generations. It's a response to the Wind Rush Generation scandal set in a university. The play features five students trying to seek out the ghost of the Empire Windrush, a ship that was originally called Monte Rosa and used by the Nazis to transport Jewish people to their deaths during the Holocaust. The hidden history of the Windrush ship and its role in the Holocaust and the hidden history of how slave labour helped fund British universities is addressed in the play. And throughout the script, I play on the words wind and rush, connecting racism and climate. I want to close by sharing a poem that made its way into the play. It was written out of rage when four of my white male colleagues, all professors in the Department of, Eng of English at Queen Mary, voted in favour of effectively, effectively bypassing equal opportunities in order to improve our REF research scores. The rest of us thankfully voted against, but the fact that these people thought it was okay and proceeded to make a joke about it in a meeting left me boiling. I wrote about it in the white colleague listen letter that led to the founding of the Revolution or Nothing Network. So I won't go into the incident now, you can read about it. However, I do want to end on a more empowering note by sharing the poem that arose from that moment at work. A pain warning, the poem repeatedly uses the word bitch, a word I do not like or use for its sexist connotations. However, the poem is an homage to Linton Kwesi Johnson's iconic 1980s dub poem, England is a Bitch, where he rhymes about how he is treated at work and in everyday life as a black man in England. My version is called English is a Bitch. 
it's spoken by the voice of the wind, talking back to English. English is a bitch. Been no escaping it. English is a bitch. I want a word with it. You named oceans, oceans, and earth, you gave quaked. But what a careless noun for me you did make. You called forest, forest, desert, fire, and sky. But if you did not feel me, you'd say, what am I from this name? Ind, wind, a fart of a word, a foul letter word, a trump upward hot air, a tight little title, a mean little rival for vento, viento, upepo. Could have named me something Arabic, Gaelic, Bantu, Asiatic. You could have had Latin, but you chose Germanic, wind, wind. Only a liar's rhyme you can make with it. Even Shakespeare couldn't much play with it. Sinned, pinned, mind, kind. Kindred spirits, my name has not. Elemental insult, my name is a wind-up. English is a bitch. Be no escape in it. English is a bitch. And I want a word with it. Anglo, I am angry, long neglected by language. What kind of mother tongue is so lazy, limp and languid that she can't even credit her subject with a password he can be proud of? My moniker makes a mockery of all I've done for this country. My label should be libelous. Would it really have been so onerous to make me a little more sonorous, a little consonant, a little vowel? So yes, I'll howl through your doors in a rush, in a wind rush, I deserve more. This linguistic disrespect needs addiction fixing. Some lexiconization, some thesaurization, a new appellation for this misrepresentation. Proper noun reparation with certification. I demand new nomenclature, powerful, elegant, mature sounding, reflecting the true status of my intrinsic Englishness. For an island is not an island without the weather, you see. You should have shown me some respect. I've been here for centuries. English is a bitch. Been no escape in it. English is a bitch. And I want a word with it. Didn't I give birth to breeze on this land? I delivered you the tempest right here where I stand. Bluster, gale, gust. I raised a hurricane. Yet you classify me with a mere one syllable name. Didn't I turn your mills to grind your grain, to bake your bread so you would never feel the pain of hunger like your empire inflicted upon 30 million Indians, 1 million in Ireland? English is a bitch. Been no escape in it. English is a bitch. And I want a word with it. So don't blame me when you chop too many trees and I race across your fields and reap devastation. Don't blame me when you turn up the heat and it makes me swell and arrive unexpected. Don't blame me if I bring the desert to your door, the waters to your window, if I bring war, if I rise up from rivers of blood. Don't blame me for this hostility, for this Britannia is your legacy. And this you must know, you reap what you sow. And despite this this pitiful one syllable name, a mere footprint and a missing document that's still a source of shame. The nature of wind, the nature of wind rush, the nature of this generation has changed. We don't want to take questions. But we do have questions for you. These questions come partly from thinking with the Jewish and Irish American theorists, Noel Ignatiev and John Garvey, who describe in their book Race Traitor how Irish and Jewish people became white. What then would it mean to come back to black? Ignatiev and Garvey argue for the abolition of whiteness, a bold call not for allies, but for traitors to whiteness. And whiteness was never just about melanin. It was always about money. I imagine that many people from Irish travel communities could attest to the fact that white skinned people also suffer from white supremacy and are not necessarily afforded the privileges of whiteness. So what would a world without whiteness look like? Amitav Ghosh, in his brilliant book, The Great Derangement, argues that the failure to address the climate catastrophe is a failure of the imagination. Frederick Jameson claimed it was easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. 
Malcolm X said, there is no capitalism without racism. What would it mean then to try to imagine the end of racism, the end of capitalism? What if we talked about racism more than we talk about the weather? What if we applied our imaginations to ending this white climate crisis? And could you do the work yourself and not ask us for help when we are shivering naked in the snow? And no, I will not help you with your bibliography this semester. <laughs>